1980, the small mountain town of Ambato is celebrating the festival of fruits and flowers. But this year, the joy of carnival is muted. Dozens of girls between the ages of 8 and 12 have vanished. The whole province, even the whole country, saw that there were so many little girls disappearing and nobody really knew what was happening. Their parents were desperate for answers. I told her to go sell some things, to buy a bus ticket home and come back. And she didn't come back. We thought maybe somebody had kidnapped her for a ransom, or that somebody took her to another country. We thought they had taken her because she was very pretty, very pretty. At first, local police did little. They assumed the girls were just runaways. Unfortunately, the police did not take the disappearances of the little girls seriously. The police issued a release saying that the disappearances of the girls was because they had failed their school year. The families did what they could to find their daughters. The last girl, Ivanova Garzón, her mother put ads in newspapers, put ads on street lamps that said she'd give a reward of 20,000 sucres if someone gave some news about the little girl, but nothing. And then the bodies of some of the girls started showing up. They had been raped and strangled. More young girls disappeared. Now the families demanded answers. But the police had no leads and no suspects. We didn't have any evidence to begin to identify a suspect. We didn't have anyone who could provide some type of identification or give us a sketch. The citizens of Ecuador became wary. The killer could be anywhere. Sunday, March 9th, 1980, a typical morning in Ambato. The plaza buzzed with activity. Fruit and vegetable vendors were setting up their stalls. Hot food stands were already cooking. paid any attention to a stranger peddling his wares. He was selling chains, padlocks, and other trinkets. The man walked the plaza most of the day. Then he approached a vendor named Carlina Ramon. It was around 4 o'clock in the afternoon. This man asks me to sell him food. He began looking into my pots to see what I had. And then he kept looking at my daughter as if to try to get her attention. Carlina's daughter Alicia was 11 years old at the time. He would look at me funny, strangely, and gesture for me to come over. So I went to my mother and told her, you know what, mommy, this man keeps looking at me ugly and keeps calling me to come to him. Carlina spotted the man leaving the plaza. She'd heard about the missing girls of Ecuador and immediately was suspicious. She recruited other vendors to help catch him. Just outside the plaza, Carlina and her friends overtook the man and dragged him back. Carlina accused him of kidnapping and killing the little girls. He says, no, ma'am, I'm a poor worker. I'm a humble man. I'm not a thief. I'm not anything. I have a clean heart. The townspeople weren't convinced. They held the man until police came to take him in for questioning. Police 
priest learned his name was Pedro Alonso Lopez, a native of Colombia. Interrogators tried strong-arming Lopez to gain more information. They could not apply force or intimidation in the investigation. It didn't work. The man refused to talk. But then, after a few hours in detention, Lopez began opening up to an officer named Pastor Cordova. Pastor Cordova, the captain at the time, took charge of the case and began to do a very scientific and intelligent investigation by gaining his trust. It was to him that Lopez confessed his story. He said he'd spent the last seven years traveling between Colombia, Ecuador, and Peru. And in those three countries, he claimed he had raped and murdered as many as 300 young girls. The captain was stunned. It seemed impossible that one man could have carried out so much violence. If Lopez was telling the truth, he'd rank among the most prolific serial killers in history. He seemed like an ordinary person. It was unbelievable that this man killed so many little girls. News of the capture of Pedro Lopez soon hit the airwaves. Lopez relished the attention. He wasn't shy about discussing his crimes or philosophizing about life and death on camera. Lopez, it seemed, hoped to gain a twisted kind of immortality. Lopez seemed proud of raping and murdering so many young girls. He said the grave sites were scattered all over the country and offered to lead police to each one. He would take the girls to the desolate areas, fulfill his sexual appetite, and then he would strangle them and leave them covered in newspapers or branches. His confession set off a heartbreaking six-week search for the bodies of his victims. Something that struck me about Pedro Alonso was how cold he acted when he was identifying the grave sites. It was as if what he'd done was normal. Lopez would lead police across 11 Ecuadorian provinces, a journey that would reveal the truth behind this seemingly insignificant man. March 1980, police in Ambato, Ecuador, captured Pedro Alonso Lopez. While in custody, Lopez claimed to have raped and killed more than 300 girls from Colombia, Ecuador, and Peru. As proof, he agreed to show police the grave sites of his victims. Nobody realized it was the criminal who was leading police to the graves. They dressed him up as a policeman and nobody recognized him. Their first stop was on the outskirts of Ambato. He told police he had caught a girl who sold newspapers and that he killed her and that she was buried under the Ficoa Bridge. We found a complete skeleton with clothes on it. Of course, the body was decomposed. And when we look at it, we found the bones were corroded. I remember, a leg and a hand. It was the corpse of Hortensia Garcis Lozada. Lopez had killed her 10 months before. At first, police had difficulty identifying the body. But Hortensia's family had arrived and seen something they recognized. We were beginning to take out the body, and the family members recognized the clothes. 
And then we knew that that was our sister. We went and found her remains. That's all, just bones. Oh, I was suffering for my daughter. The tortures he did, what he did, his terror. It was terrible for a father to see the horrors that he committed when you saw her. If I had a gun, I would kill him. But there was a policeman on one side and a policeman on another side. The father wanted to kill this criminal. He shouted, justice, justice. And the people began to throw rocks at us. Then police intervened. They had to take him out disguised because people wanted to lynch him. They wanted to kill him. The discovery of Hortensia Garces Lozada was only the beginning. As men, as police, we felt the need for revenge, but we had to hold out until the very end. It was very emotional for us, even though we were professionals. We couldn't stand what was going on, but we had to control ourselves until we got the information we needed. Police did their best to keep Lopez talking. One strategy we used was to give him tobacco, coffee. We invited him to eat chicken. We gave him beer, and he calmed himself completely. Over the next six weeks, Lopez led investigators to gravesite after gravesite. It was a horrific tour that Lopez seemed eager to take. He remembered everything, places, dates and times, and descriptions of the girls. Just an incredible memory. He remembered where he had buried the bodies of the little girls. Not only in Ambato, but in the surrounding different sectors of Tunguragua. He was satisfied that he had shown us the bodies. He didn't feel anything. No remorse, no guilt, nothing. At a gravesite in Salcedo, Ecuador, Lopez showed off his brutal handiwork. He grabbed the skull and placed it under his arm so we could take a picture of him. Captain Cordova took it away from him. What he wanted was to have a trophy, and he was proudly showing what he had done. In all, police would unearth the remains of 57 of Lopez's young victims. The case of the missing girls was solved, but there was another mystery. What had led Pedro Lopez to commit such terrible crimes? As the investigation progressed, Lopez began to confide in Captain Cordova. It was because of this confidence, this friendship he had with Captain Cordova, which made him refer to the captain as papa. The absence of a father for Pedro made him look for one in other people. Lopez never knew his own father, Medardo Reyes. Reyes was a member of Colombia's Conservative Party who was caught in the crossfire of La Violencia, Colombia's civil war. He was shot and killed on April 9, 1948. At the time, Lopez's mother was three months pregnant with Pedro. I thought I was going to lose him from the shock. I could feel him inside me, but he was of strong blood. Six months later, on October 8, 1948, Pedro Lopez was born in the Colombian town of Santa Isabel. When he was about five years old, he and his family moved to Espinal. According to his mother, Lopez was a polite child who dreamed of being a teacher. He liked to help the other children, and with his notebook, he helped them practice their vowels so they would learn. He said, Mom, isn't it true that I'm good at teaching the children? One day I'm going to be a teacher. I said, yes, son, please keep teaching them. What else can a mother say? 
But Lopez and his mother have very different accounts of what his childhood was like. She claims that even though they were poor, she was a loving mother. In a recorded interview, Lopez claimed she was abusive. That woman was violent. It is my understanding that this woman is sick in the head because that was not the proper way to punish your children. She would punish me with such violence. Lopez also claimed that his mother was a prostitute. As a little boy, he witnessed his mother commit sexual acts with men and they hit her. In his mind, he began to believe that he had to defend what had happened to his mother and defend himself because his mother was very rough on him and would beat him. At age eight, Pedro Lopez ran away from home. His mother believed he was kidnapped by a neighbor. That night I cried and cried. I looked all over for him and I couldn't find him. Then I went to a man who is a fortune teller in Flanders and he said that Pedro went in a car with a man from Cali. I borrowed money to go and I cried and cried. They killed his father and now my son was stolen. In fact, Pedro was headed to Bogota on his own, a mere child. He would have to make his home on the vicious streets of Colombia's capital city. It was here that he learned to survive on violence and hatred. It was on these mean streets that a serial killer was born. March 1980, serial killer Pedro Lopez led police to the burial sites of many of his young victims. In a recorded interview, details of his past began to emerge. I was a very alert child, very spirited with an innocent mind. The majority of my childhood, I was abandoned, lived in filth and sleazy places. My life has been dishonest because of being abandoned. The years can affect someone and change one drastically. In 1956, eight-year-old Pedro Lopez was a runaway, trying to survive on the streets of Bogota, Colombia. He was one of thousands of homeless children called gamines, who made up the lowest rung of city life. Most of these kids left their houses because they're abused, and the only place they can end up are the streets, because they don't have any other option. Lopez was now a part of the city's underbelly. He dug through garbage to eat and clothe himself. He began smoking a popular street drug called basuco, a highly dangerous, impure form of cocaine. For protection, he joined a gang of other gamines. They make um, very, very strong bonds between themselves. They stick together for long periods of time. They help each other, they protect each other. They have to defend themselves. They have to learn how to survive all together. Lopez and his gang fought with knives and belts against other gamines for sleeping spots. Violence became a normal part of Lopez's life. They learn so many things. They have to learn how to survive. And if you're going to survive on the streets, you have to steal. And if you're going to survive with other kids that are delinquents, you have to learn how to defend yourself, how to fight. Lopez says he was hardened by these experiences. It was during this time, he later claimed, that he'd been sexually victimized by a man. Being a child, I lost my innocence. They dishonored me. I was a small child, very innocent. It was something I wanted to forget. I don't deny that it affected me. I have always wanted to punish those responsible. According to Lopez, a man offered him a bed and a hot meal. Lopez accepted, but instead was taken to an abandoned building and raped. I hated it. 
When I see a certain person, let's say a male adult, that does not respect a young boy, well, I see to it to fix that person. Lopez said he couldn't go to the police. Rarely did they do anything about the plight of a gamine. After the incident, he said he went outside only at night. Another time when Lopez was 10, he said he was approached by an elderly American couple living in Bogota. He said they offered him a home because the sight of him begging on the street broke their hearts. According to Lopez, the couple enrolled him in a school for orphans. For a couple of years, he led a stable life, but his good fortune did not last. When he was 12 years old, a male teacher sexually molested him at his school. Lopez stole money from the school's office and ran away from the couple who had taken him in. He returned to the only thing he knew, Bogota's violent streets. What did that gamin do? So that is what I declare, that I am 31 years old and I have led a backward life, disoriented, that I have been without support and help, but what mostly I needed was support. Lopez lived on the streets of Bogota for 13 years. In 1969, at age 21, he was arrested for stealing a car. After only two days behind bars, he was brutally raped by two older inmates. In retaliation, Lopez fashioned a crude knife out of a prison utensil and murdered his rapists. When I was locked up in Colombia, I was taught how to defend myself. I don't deny that in Carcel Modelo, I killed two in there. But the warden said, don't worry. Authorities deemed the murders self-defense. No extra prison time was added to Lopez's sentence. But these murders were the beginning of a new chapter in Lopez's violent life. He swore he would never be a victim again, and he vowed to seek his own brand of justice for all he'd endured. At age 23, Pedro Alonso Lopez was released from prison went on the hunt. In 1971, 23-year-old Pedro Alonso Lopez was released after serving two years for car theft. He had endured an abusive home, the violent streets of Colombia, and a prison rape. Now, he wanted revenge. He began by searching for easy targets in towns in Colombia, Ecuador, and Peru. They were poor, indigenous people, street vendors. These were the types of little girls that he chose, the poorest kids who have lesser education. He never chose white people. Lopez would pose as a salesman and approach girls between eight and 12 years old. He would appeal to them and he would tell them, eh, I'm lost, could you help me find the way to the bus? Could you help me find the way out to, to, of the town? Lopez relied on his charm to draw the girls away. He never physically kidnapped any of his victims. He would show himself like helpless so the children would trust him a little bit more. After that, he would take them to, to a place where if the, the, the children would scream, they wouldn't be heard. First, he would sexually assault them. He slept all night with her and then raped her again in the morning and then killed her. He would spend a long time with them. Incredibly, he would later claim that he was helping his victims. He said he strangled them so they would go to heaven so that they wouldn't suffer in this world. In this way, Lopez murdered dozens of girls, and yet his crimes received little attention, and he killed again and again. After a cooling off period, he would look for his next victim, and uh, 
and do it over and over again to satisfy his urges and his fantasies. In April 1979, he made his way to Ambato, Ecuador, looking for more victims. He met 11-year-old Hortensia Garces Lozada while she was selling newspapers. My mom was pregnant at the time, and when she sold newspapers, she saved money to be able to provide for my brother. On May 5, 1979, Lopez asked Hortensia to be his guide in the city and gave her 100 sucres, about 10 US dollars. He led her to the outskirts of town underneath a bridge, and then he raped her, beat her, and strangled her. He threw her body into a ditch and covered it with the same newspapers she'd been selling. When Hortensia didn't come home, her father, Leonidas, searched for her. She was out there somewhere, but I didn't find her. I couldn't find her. Although dozens of girls have been reported missing, police insisted the girls were runaways and did nothing to help the grieving families. The police are against the people. They saved him. Here in this country, only the rich people have access to the police, to justice. Lopez soon found another victim in Ambato, nine-year-old Ivanova Hakome. But this time, he went after the wrong target. Ivanova was the daughter of a successful baker. The day my daughter disappeared was February 14, 1988, 11 in the morning. I had a bakery in the Avenida de los Andes, and I had a branch office about 15 blocks away. My daughter sometimes came to bring me something to eat. That day, I waited for her, and she never came. Because Carlos Jacome was a respected businessman, when he reported his daughter missing, the police responded. Soon, news of the other missing girls began to spread. I took up flyers. I spread them all over Ecuador asking for information, but we didn't find out anything. 22 days later, on March 8th, the police recovered a little girl's body in a wooden shack on La Florida, a farm near town. Some radio reporters came to my house and they said, Carlos, a body of a little girl has been found. And so I went to the hospital morgue and that's when I went in and I saw my daughter. I'm still devastated. For me, it was very tragic. News coverage warned the citizens of Ambato of a killer in their midst. As a result, Lopez was captured by townspeople after he attempted to kidnap a girl from the Plaza Urbina. That same day, the Hakome family buried Ivanova. That is when we knew who the criminal was. As of that day, things were discovered and he began to say that there were cadavers here and there were cadavers there and there were cadavers in the other provinces. Pedro Lopez's reign of terror was over. He willingly showed police 57 bodies and based on his confessions, was charged with 110 counts of murder. Claimed to have committed 200 more. I am the worst of the worst. Perhaps I took it too far because of my ignorance. The law of the law. Perhaps even a complete animal. But as the case went to trial, victims' families feared justice would not be served. This seemingly mad killer had, in fact, been carefully plotting his crimes and he knew that the laws of Ecuador were on his side. If somebody killed one person, or killed a hundred, or killed a thousand, he would receive the same sentence. On July 31st, 1981, 
33-year-old Pedro Alonso Lopez pled guilty in an Ecuadorian court to the murders of 57 girls. He was now imprisoned in the town of Ambato. There, he agreed to be interviewed by a local reporter. I can declare I, Pedro Alonso Lopez, author of these acts, declare myself guilty. Throughout the interview, Lopez tried to explain his crimes. First, he claimed that he was a killer because of the sexual and physical abuse he had suffered as a child. I, Pedro Alonso Lopez, who supposedly eliminated a small group of insignificants and allegedly took away their innocence. But my innocence has been taken away from me. I think that it did have something to do with the way he constructed in his head what sex or sexual relations are. If it's always forced on you, if it's always through violence, and if you receive it in your own life, why not repeat it with somebody else? But psychologists believe Lopez's brutal crimes also satisfied another twisted desire. Uno de los motivos por los cuales él tenía que matarlas era porque eran pobres. One of the reasons he said he killed them was because they were poor. Maybe he found them ugly or useless and he tried to stomp out the weakness. This allows him to feel stronger, bigger. He was always an unimportant person. He was living on the streets. He had no recognition, no social recognition whatsoever. And this was a moment for him to be, to be big, to show the world what he was doing. Curiously, Lopez spoke of his victims as if he cared about them and believed he'd saved them from a life of misery. He thinks that he had to save the girls from poverty. He calls them my muñequitas, my dolls. He's, he, he even tries to talk about them as if he feels he's saving them, that he has a mission. On other occasions, Lopez blamed an alternate personality called Jorge Patino for the murders. While in prison, Lopez underwent a psychological evaluation. It was determined that he was a sociopath, that he suffered from an antisocial personality disorder. He does not consciously know right from wrong, and he does not feel guilty or remorseful for what he does. He is not able of understanding other people's pain or feelings, that what he does is for his own pleasure, without uh, any concern of the other person. But are his statements signs of a pathology or merely of a cruel and calculating mind? You ask me if I felt anything while asphyxiating certain persons. Well, no. It's strange, no? Someone who shoots another with a gun and the other person feels the pain of the bullet, is the shooter going to feel the same agony or the same pain? Lopez was very good at using his words to manipulate others. People with uh, personality disorders are very smart and they use their language in a way to try to justify their actions very well. They're, they're very skillful. A person that has a personality disorder, but that has contact with reality is gonna be much more careful because even though he doesn't care about his victim, he doesn't wanna be caught. And he was aware that the laws of Ecuador would protect him. He knew that it didn't matter how many girls he killed. The law did not allow for consecutive sentences. Even if you kill one or a thousand, it's 16 years. Lopez was right. His sentence amounted to four months for every girl he murdered. The fact that he only got 16 years, that's not justice. A fair sentence would have been life in prison. The authorities and the laws are terrible. They should have seen it was a special case. They didn't do it. After 
two years in prison in Ambato, Lopez was transferred to the Garcia Moreno, a prison in Quito, Ecuador. He was kept in Papayan D, the wing reserved for murderers and rapists. Lopez passed his days alone, smoking basuco, scribbling in a diary, and carving coins with Jesus on one side and the devil on the other. I have always lived in poverty, and I have ambition being powerful one day, or of great importance. I understand what I have done. There is no going back. He served his time patiently. He would be a free man by his 50th birthday, and soon be able to wander the countryside again. August 31st, 1994, serial killer Pedro Alonso Lopez was released from the Garcia Moreno prison after serving 14 years of a 16-year sentence. He was released two years early for good behavior. Because of his conduct, they pardoned him a few years and he got out. And he got out when he was still very young, 45 years old. The parents of the murdered girls were devastated by the length of Lopez's sentence, and many people thought someone should take the law into their own hands. I wanted revenge. I wanted to break him into pieces because he killed my baby. My friends gathered wood so I could try and burn him alive. There was so much rage. The people asked the president of the country for a reform of the laws. But the victims' families would have no chance to seek vengeance because Lopez's stay in Ecuador was short-lived. He was detained just one hour after he was released. The superintendent of the province had ordered him back into custody so that he could be deported to Colombia. The next day, on September 1st, Ecuadorian immigration officials handed Lopez over to Colombian authorities at the Rumicacha International Bridge at the border of the two countries. One of the most prolific serial killers in history was home. The high authorities, judges, never do justice for the poor person. They always do it against the poor people. Those of us who have a house, a family, we have to take care of ourselves and look out for ourselves. I would ask those who make the laws judges, lawmakers, to work for the humble people and the poor people. I would ask that they do justice and protect everyone so this kind of crimes never happen again. Authorities feared Lopez would continue killing people. The Colombian DAS, the country's national security department, would not allow him to roam at will. Shortly after his arrival in Colombia, DAS officials picked him up, processed him, and then handed him over to prosecutors in the Colombian state of Tolima. There, prosecutors hoped to take advantage of the country's harsher laws and put Lopez away for good. Lopez was charged with a two decades old murder case. Back in December 1979, Lopez had traveled to Espinal. Within a month, 12-year-old Flor Sanchez disappeared. Her body had been found half buried in a rural area near the city. Her mother, Alba Sanchez, identified her daughter's remains later that day at the police station. I entered and they said, inspect the clothes, maybe there's a little dress. Yes, it was my daughter. The murder seemed to match Lopez's pattern, and Colombian authorities had more than enough evidence for a conviction.
God forgive me, they should take his life. How can you let a guy live that keeps killing like this? Why would they let him live? Yet again, Lopez dodged harsh punishment. In late 1995, he was declared insane and condemned to the psychiatric wing of the Carcel Modelo in Bogota. Just three years later, in February of 1998, a prison psychiatrist declared Lopez sane. It, it could either be that the psychiatrist really felt that he was recovered or that he faked it. I mean, he went on for 10, 12 years killing people without being caught. He was smart. He could have faked being better. He could have faked change. A mere $50 bail freed this serial killer. He was released with two conditions. He had to continue to receive psychiatric treatment and report once a month to a judge. Lopez decided to revisit his past. He traveled to Espinal from Bogota to see his mother, Benilda, for the first time in 19 years. The day he came to visit me, he says to me, Mother, kneel down in front of me so I can bless you. And I said, the one who should kneel down is you. The son is the one who kneels before his mother. He got down on only one knee. But then Lopez showed his cruel streak. He said, Mother, I came to see what you would give me of my inheritance. And I said to him, I'm so poor. How am I going to give you something? I just have a chair and a bed. He took those two things and put them on the porch, and I started crying. And he said, who will buy this? If not, I'll light them on fire. Then a woman bought the chair and the little bed, and then he left. Lopez pocketed the money and disappeared. He went back into the countryside he knew so well, to the killing ground where he had found so many victims. That was the last time anyone reported seeing Pedro Alonso Lopez. His mother believes he has managed to avoid being killed by the families of his victims. Up until now, I haven't felt it. When someone dies, you feel a shock, and I haven't felt anything. I believe in what our Lord says. When a person dies, it's revealed to others. So there was nothing revealed to me. About 20 years after Pedro Lopez was arrested in Embato, Ecuadorian officials changed the maximum sentence for murder from 16 years to 25 years. Then, in October 2002, Interpol released an advisory on behalf of the Colombian authorities, stating they were looking for Lopez. They suspect he had committed another murder in Espinal. How many victims do you think you have killed? Sir, to give you the exact number, I don't know if I could tell you. It's like a superiority. Like I am a god. I give life and I can take it away.